Okay. <clears throat> well, as Stephen said, I did weigh the titles, and the one that the one that got away was my favorite, which is <clears throat> Fifty Shades of Gray Matter. <laughs> <laughs> because the book, the, the subtitle is The Seductive Appeal of Mindless Neuroscience. Not of neuroscience. Neuroscience in and of itself is certainly not mindless. It's the next great scientific frontier. And uh, to the extent that we know a lot, we still know maybe this much of what is going to be an enormously long continuum of, of accumulated knowledge way beyond our lifetimes. So it's a, it's a vibrant, amazing field with magnificent technology. The signature, I would say the signature tool of which is the brain scan. And we spend a lot of time in the book talking about the brain scan. Um, why is it so seductive, in fact? And, um, and we believe it's because of, uh, basically, it's a perfect storm of four, of, of four uh, forces. The first is it's, it's technology. And that in of itself is always compelling, cutting edge cutting edge and, and uh, bringing with it the su suggestion of great objectivity. The subject on which that technology is trained, the brain, is without question the most complex entity in all of biology, possibly the cosmos. Um, it is visual. Uh, you can, that's more than you can say about genetics, which th there are a lot of overlaps. Uh, between neuroscience as a explainer of uh, at one explanatory level of human behavior, just as genetics is as well, but genetics does not have that physical dimension. A brain scan is terminally arresting, it's absolutely gorgeous, and we are fundamentally visual species. So that's number three. And the fourth is that a brain scan to the uninitiated, not to you know more sophisticated folks, like I'm sure most of you in the audience, but to, to you know, the average person who sees it in the Science Times or on the cover of, of Time magazine, um, you know, looks at this gorgeous image, and, and if that image is, let's say, um, placed next to, if the brain of, uh, let's say, an addict is used to, to illustrate some dimension of addiction, it's way too seductive to look at that illuminated spot in the reward pathway and think that the behavior that flowed from it was inevitable and, in con and uncontrollable. Uh, that's a very important point. Uh, just because things are in the brain, and I know what most of you folks know this, but uh, our book, in fact, was really a culture book more, more than even a science book, and the, I think the average person does not appreciate that <clears throat> because things are in the brain, because where else would they be, um, that the behavior that then flows from that brain activity, uh, again, was something the person could or could not control. The tendency is to see it as something uncontrollable. That, of course, is where the, the, the trial lawyers come in. So um, those are the four elements of why I think uh, brain scans are just so captivating. And uh, so in the book, what we do is talk about uh, four basic dimensions of, again, I call mindless neuroscience. The first is the premature application of, of certain technologies. Uh, for example, I'm sure you've heard, being, being at Pan, I'm sure by now most of you have heard of things like commercial enterprises like No Lie MRI which is, uh, it bills itself as a kind of lie detection uh, device. The, the, short, the, the sh short story behind that is, you know, there, there is something, there's something to uh, detecting neural signatures of deception. There's something to that, but certainly not at the point where one could uh, use this as any kind of fail-safe uh, uh, lie detection test. However, that's how uh, these companies, I think there are two of them, maybe one of them just went out of business. Somehow I remember well, we, we reading. Can, we can only hope. Uh, oh, it, I thought it, one of them. It didn't go out of business, it just stopped doing this form of business. I see, okay. Um, but there, and, uh, but my sense is that 
at least the no lie is doing pretty well. A lot of uh, actually people who are interested in checking up on their spouses, I understand, are uh, one of their biggest customers. They want to know, <laughs> did you really cheat on your wife? Mm. That kind of thing. But employers use it as well because, as you know, the polygraph has great limitations. And so the idea, understandably, was let's go directly to the organ of deception, which is the brain. It's not a crazy notion. It's just not ready for prime time yet. Um, we devote a whole chapter to, to what you can and can't tell using brain-derived data on whether or not people are telling the truth. But that's an example of a premature application. Uh, some, of the, some of the things we talk about in the book are a matter of the technology just not being ripe, and others have to do with conceptual uh, problems that neuroscientists, some neuroscientists think can be resolved through neuroscience, but I happen to, I happen to see that differently. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute, and I, I'll preview that by saying that has to do with the question of free will, which is a topic of my co-author Scott Lilienfeld and I were uh, hesitant, uh, wary about taking on because it always ends in tears. I mean, it's a very <laughs> super hard problem. And I'm a psychiatrist by training, and Scott is a psychologist with a very, uh, I'd say, a very robust background in the philosophy of science, but nevertheless. So we have the premature application. We have the neuroentrepreneurs, some of those who were te uh, selling these lie detecting um, things. Uh, a uh, gentleman named, uh, for example, I forgot his first name, but it's Ammon, who's, who, what? Daniel. Daniel Ammon, Dan Ammon, who uh, has a, a brain imaging empire and um, insists he can make diagnoses through brain images. Now, again, that's something where I'm, I'm sure there will be progress, and, and we will, be, it will have some diagnostic use in, in, in the future. Right now, that's, that's not a strong, uh, those claims are not very strong. Um, so premature application, neuroentrepreneurship, which is also very vibrant in the field called neuromarketing. Uh, again, we can go back to that in a way, in, in, if you'd like to later, but the, the basic idea there, kind of like the lie detection, is that, you know, people are often this is, or rather they're especially unreliable in focus groups in terms of telling marketers what they intend to do in terms of purchasing behavior and even in terms of why they like something. People are pretty good at saying whether they do or don't like something, but they're pretty, they're not so good at intuiting uh, why. And in, in fact, in, in, in general, there are many weaknesses that, that people have in introspecting. And uh, there's a wonderful book by Timothy Wilson called Strangers to Ourselves, which is all about that, but in the, in the psychological realm. In the neuromarketing realm, uh, you know, there's, there's a reason why these guys can want to go straight to the brain to see whether or not they can uh, divine something about a potential consumer's thoughts or attitudes or intentions about a product, but they're not there yet. And, or maybe they never will. It's hard to know whether they'll ever be there or not because it's very hard to get any good data because it's pr proprietary. So the literature, what's, it's in the literature and what you can read in Forbes and Wall Street Journal and business-related magazines are almost parodies. Like we put people in a brain scan and ask them whether they liked, you know, this, um, this uh, uh, packaging for a snack, and we decided they felt guilty when they saw this color. I mean, something like that. It's almost a, a parody of how one might interpret a brain scan. Um, so there's neuromarketing as another form of entrepreneurship. Then a third uh, big theme of the book out of, the f out of four is what we call the levels of analysis. The levels of analysis problem, um, and that has to do with and this is where addiction comes in. In fact, this is why we really wrote the book. Scott and I were actually both so frustrated that over the years, addiction has been now formulated to be a brain pathology. Now, I'm not going to, of course, say addic addiction and drugs don't affect the brain. Of course they do. But that kind of neurocentric view, which applies to a lot of problems in psychiatry, PTSD, depression, um, is a problematic one because it puts way too much emphasis on a single level of analysis, the neural level. Uh, that's one explanatory level. 
But that doesn't do justice to the very, very complex phenomenon that is addiction. There is a psychological level, the notion that people use drugs for reasons, which you'd know if you treated people, uh, that behavioral interventions happen to be the most effective ones. I should say I work in a methadone clinic, so I have no ideological problem with using drugs to help patients if they you know, I'm a complete utilitarian. So if there was a great drug, I would use it. Methadone so far is the best drug we have, and even that really, I would argue, doesn't really treat addiction. It treats withdrawal. Now for some people, treating withdrawal is enough. It's stabilizing enough for them to get on their way, but, um, but the point is that we don't treat patients now. Maybe we'll be better in the future, but right now it is not the neural level at which our treatments are primarily directed. I, and what, I, what treatments would be primarily directed would be medications or, I guess, implants. We treat people most effectively at the psychological and especially at the behavioral level through contingency management, uh, rewards, and, and sanctions. There's a huge literature on that. It's especially helpful in diversionary, uh, diversionary programs in the criminal justice system where, uh, where uh, uh, addict patients <laughs> are, are um, told, for example, they, that they have to pass urine screens and they're given a timetable about what's expected, and basically if they comply with the uh, expectations, seeing their counselors, giving clean urines, whatever it is, um, things will be fine if they do that for a year. There's a reward at the end, which is to say that their charges are dropped, and if they uh, mess up along the way, there are consequences, maybe a night in jail, something like that, but they are they're swift and certain, but they're not severe. It's classic behavioral management, and it's enormously effective. Um, and, uh, and I also think that um, addiction is a very good illustrator of the fact that, yes, there are brain changes. I mean, that's, in fact, the folks who, who really uh, inst instituted that rhetoric um, that addiction is a brain disease will say, when you ask them, why is it a brain disease? Why isn't it a spiritual disease if a person got better through AA? I mean, what, why is it a brain disease of all the kinds of diseases it could be? Why not an environmental disease? Since we know that the, almost all the, the addicted uh, servicemen in Vietnam stopped using when they came back home. So why is it a brain disease? Well, the answer you get is because drugs change the brain. The brain is changed in the process of addiction. Well, that's true, but the question is, what kinds of changes are they? And the important thing to me is that they're not the kind of changes that you might see in, in what we call more classically, a more classic of brain disease, let's say Alzheimer's. In the case of Alzheimer's, the nature of those brain diseases make it impossible for the person to deter the behavior we care about most, or I, I guess I should say the activity we care about most, which is memory deterioration. I could threaten to punish you if your memory deteriorated further. I could reward you, or say I would reward you, with a million bucks if your memory didn't deteriorate. And you know what? That wouldn't matter, because the nature of those brain changes are such that they're non-deterrable through psychological means. I tell a drug addict, I'm going to give it a million, they will stop. And I tell them they're going to be punished. They, they you know, if you do this in a, as I said, according to these careful rules of behavioral modification, it works if these are meaningful sanctions and rewards. It works. Those are they're the kinds of brain changes in addiction allow that to happen. And that's really the essence of voluntariness defined in a behavioral way. Can the course of a behavior be changed by its foreseeable consequences? That can happen in addiction. And that's really, really important to me because so much of the so much of the biological work on, on addiction uh, is often presented as evidence that addiction is involuntary. Uh, and as I said in my definition of what voluntary is and what it isn't, addiction is not involuntary. And that's, that's great news because it makes it so much more possible for us to help folks. And finally, um, of course, we get to moral agency. And, and basically the question is there 
Now we're going to get, you know, we're going to get much better at giving biological explanations for complex behavior. We're already better at it than we were roughly three years ago and better than we were 20 years ago and better and better. Um, we can talk more about the neural mechanisms and the circuitry involved, which is really where we are. We're, we're be, be, way beyond the kind of, I'll, I'll say this with quotes because I don't believe that brain scanning is neurophrenology. I do not believe that. But the way it was often portrayed as these bright lights, you know, flashing, and this center means there's a center for this, and this means that, we're way beyond that. The circuits, of course, are where the, the action is. Um, but, uh, but when it comes to, um, I think I lost my train of thought there for a second. Moral agency. Yeah, moral agency. I forgot where I was going exactly. But um, oh, right. I'm sorry. Biologicalists. The more we can think, the more we are able to to describe ourselves mechanistically, the greater the tendency. Again, for for the average folks who don't do this for a living, is to see uh, our behaviors uh, beyond addiction, or our behaviors in general, as as involuntary. Now, some of our behaviors are involuntary, a lot of them are, but this is not something that we can tell, in, let's say, in the, in the context of a courtroom by looking at a brain scan. A, a brain scans are not good, maybe they will get better, and, and you, you would know ben, better than anyone, will get better at being able, helping us be able to distinguish impulses that are truly resistible from impulses that are, have not been resisted, but we cannot do that that yet. Uh, so again, there is such a rhetorical, um, there's such a rhetorical pull of again these images and even just the language of of neuroscience and neural mechanisms to suggest that behaviors are not under a person's control. And it's something to to really watch for because. The, implica the, the, the implications that I worry about the most, and I don't see them now, really, are neural explanations being co-opted for political purposes. I almost sound a little paranoid, I realize when you say that, but you know, already you see them being, being used for uh, purposes. Uh, I'll give one example and then I'll let you talk. And uh, then I'll let you go. Now, this example I'm about to give, in a way, is kind of a bad example because I happen to agree with the outcome of it. Uh, uh, but, but still, it shows the again the rhetorical power of of talking about conceptualizing behavior at a neurobiological level, and that is um, adolescent crime especially the adolescent death penalty, which I'm against, don't worry. Uh, but a major part of the argumentation in, for the Supreme Court in 2005 uh, to, uh, to get the court to, to rule that uh, um, capital punishment for people younger than 18 should be cruel and unusual punishment <coughs> invoked brain science about the developing about the developing brain as if to um, as if to, to prove that uh, that people younger than 18 can are impulsive cannot really make rational good rational decisions and basically have the kind of mental capacity to be um, uh, considered culpable. Uh, now I said, I mean, I do believe that uh, there are lots of good reasons not to give the death penalty to people that age, um, but I don't think the status of their brain is, is one of them. I think it should be on an individual, you know, case by case level. If, <clears throat> I mean, I think if you're going to invoke brain science, it should be on an individual level. Uh, we're not there, even we're not even there yet but uh, to decide that a whole class of people based on brain maturity uh, cannot really make decisions about their actions, I think was kind of excessive, although it ended up you know, with a decision that I think most people were pleased with. And for what it's worth, the, the Supreme the Justices didn't, consider, didn't appear to consider that very much anyway. In subsequent cases, though, they did mention it more, in subsequent cases um, about uh, juvenile justice. So I'll, I'll sum up by saying that 
you know, Scott and I were most concerned with, you know, losing, losing the mind in the age of brain science, losing, losing, losing psychology, losing the uh, understanding of ourselves as, you know, people who in, intend things and plan things and desire things and, and uh, not as, not entities that are sort of reduced to their, to their brain functioning. And um, uh, so basically, uh, it was really, in, in some sense, our book was a plea for scientific, you know, literacy when it comes to, when it comes to brain imaging in particular, as it's used in the public sphere. It was really a matter of following brain imaging out of the, out of the lab, where right now it where it should be, um, and to some extent in the clinic, and into the public sphere of, uh, of forensics, of, of marketing, in terms of the uh, addiction, the way the, the way addiction's been treated in the popular um, literature, and uh, in terms of how we think about um, uh, responsibility. And, uh, and moral agency. I guess I didn't really talk much about free will, but maybe we could get to that later. So. My turn, great. Um, well, gosh, actually, may I ask to have the projector turned off? Just because, so I, I was assigned the role of having to disagree and debate with Sally, which is very hard because I um, uh, not only am in enormous agreement with uh, the topics that she raised in the book and have uh, been sort of uh, uh, spouting the same kinds of ideas for a long time, uh, but then I also uh, don't want to have to be put in the position of disagreeing with Sally, as she's such a clear and uh, cohesive thinker. Um, but luckily, I have spent the last couple of years having essentially this uh, uh, debate and disagreement and discussion that we're about to have uh, with my wife, with uh, me taking the Sally role and my, my wife taking the counterpoint role. So I'm going to offer some arguments culled from two years of discussion that we've put on, on this topic. And in fact, just to be more argumentative, I'm going to stand because that's uh, the way that I speak better. Because your wife stands when she that's argues right. well, with no, you. We'll she might interrupt me and take over at some point. Um, well, that's right. So as I said, I, I, let me begin by saying that uh, I am in enormous agreement with Sally with the points that she's raised. So I'm going to try and take us to a place where I can find, ooh, get ready, you're okay? I'm gonna try and take us to a place where we have some points of disagreement or discussion or topics that we can go over. Um, and to move us to there, I'm gonna start by uh, taking all of the subtle and nuanced and well-reasoned arguments that Sally makes in her book and paint them all with just one broad, uh, unsubtle brush. And uh, so then after uh, ignoring all the caveats and careful things that she says in her book, I'm going to offer my own subtle, carefully nuanced argument uh, in its place. Um, so that's where we'll start. Um, and then we'll see how far Sally lets me get away with this. So um, to preview, I'm actually going to try and grant what I take to be sort of the central thesis of Sally's book. She mentioned a few different sort of objections to how neuroscience has been used. But I think the one that really sort of hits home hardest is that of the levels of analysis, this idea that there's a, a sense in which um, neuroscience and neuroimaging results are kind of incompatible and don't have anything to say um, about the matters of behavior and social organization that she raises in the book, things about law and marketing and behavior and addiction. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grant that as a central thesis, but then argue that uh, that, that broad um, stance doesn't leave room for the possibility that neuroscience uh, can either engage in prediction and measurement uh, that might be informative to these spheres of human activity, or, uh, and I think more importantly, that that stance doesn't leave room for the illogical reality of human behavior. So that's what I want to try and go up to. Um, so I'm going to mention a little bit about what I think some of the inferential work is that neuroscience can do, and then take us just briefly through this levels of analysis argument of tallies. Um, and then talk about some of these other uh, circumstances in which it might not apply. So I think, broadly speaking, we can uh, view neuroscience as serving two functions of inference, two kinds of claims or goals that it might have. So one is uh, sort of a, a mechanism of explanation, right? So a, the, the how of behavior. And so this, I think, characterizes the last 25 years of neuroimaging research, where the goal is to say, uh, decreased activity in the nucleus accumbens is why somebody is craving cocaine, or damage to the frontal lobe is why someone has decreased impulse control. A lot of this work has been very localizationist. You know, this is the blob for 
feeling fear, this is the blob, for making rational judgments. Um, and I think this is the type of neuroscience that um, I think uh, gets called uh, into question most, uh, uh, most clearly in, in Sally's critique of the field. I'd like to contrast that with sort of another application or use of neuroscience and neuroimaging, and that's the goal of prediction and measurement. And I think this is the newer focus of the field, where instead of trying to come up with an explanation for a behavior, you're simply trying to make an empirical prediction. Based upon the level of activity we see here, what is the chance that this person will uh, use cocaine again within the, within the next six months? Based upon the pattern of activity I measure, what is the rating of subjective pain that the person would give? So basically using neuroimaging to gain access to internal mental states and to make predictions about behavior. So these are two different forms. I should mention, by the way, as an aside, that there's a third sort of uh, work that neuroimaging has done over the last 20 years, uh, and that is to promulgate a whole bunch of falsehoods about the brain and neuroscience. So one unfortunate aspect of neuroimaging is that it's grown rapidly and spread in different fields, and a lot of really crummy neuroimaging has been done and then put into glossy magazines and sold. So, um, and I think this is an area where the field has improved and uh, lots of the applications of neuroimaging to social and behavioral neuroscience are getting steadily, steadily better. In fact, led by you know, folks like Joe Cable, who we have here in the audience, who has brought like methodological rigor to areas that um, you know, previously been fuzzy areas of thinking about um, neuroscientific application of brain imaging. But I think actually the, the substance of Sally's critique uh, even is willing to grant that we've got very good brain images, that we've got true statements that we want to make about neuroscience, but that there's something about that those neuroscience claims that are kind of irrelevant to the questions we might want to ask. And so this is really the level of analysis problem. And I think the logical structure of the argument goes something like this, and that is that uh, the brain is the basis of behavior, right? So we all want to accept that. Um, if you uh, identify a group of people who have different behavior, or you identify someone who has changed their behavior, that, uh, you know, that difference must have taken place in the brain. So therefore, if you want to know something about how to change somebody's behavior or how they're different, um, you should look at behavior because it just, it's a given that if somebody has different behavior, if someone's addicted, that they're going to have some kind of brain difference associated with it or that if someone has changed their behavior, that there's gonna be some associated brain measure that goes along with it. It sort of, it, it has to be the case. So the fact that you can identify a brain change or brain difference doesn't tell you anything you didn't already logically know by the fact that behavior must be sort of an emanation of the function of the brain. So I, I'm completely sympathetic to this view, actually, and have been uh, arguing the same thing for a long time. But even given the truth of this statement, which I think is logically unassailable, I think there's still a room for neuroscience to have a role in sort of these social arenas that we've been talking about. And so I just want to briefly mention a couple of exceptions, a couple of causes or cases where, uh, where this comes up. So number one, as I mentioned before, some of the work of neuroscience, particularly in its modern era, is engaged in prediction and measurement. And, and I think, you know, as Sally mentioned in her remarks, there are applications of this kind of thing already that maybe just aren't ready for prime time. I think there are some applications which are quickly moving towards prime time. I'm just going to mention two very quickly. Tor Wager uh, is a research scientist who studies, amongst other things, the neural representation of pain. He just published a very well done study that demonstrates that you can obtain a generalizable measure of the degree of subjective pain that someone's experiencing and separate that from either the anticipation of pain or the memory of pain. And you can imagine how a uh, independent, objective measure of an internal mental state like pain would be of great use to, say, doctors and perhaps tort lawyers. Uh, and to give just another quick example, uh, Kent Keel is someone who studies, um, as a psychologist who studies criminal behavior. He recently published a paper suggesting that brain imaging data can be used to predict which criminals, after they're released from prison, are likely to be rearrested and put back in jail. And certainly that's information that if it became reliable would be of great interest to a parole officer. So I think that's one area. So the prediction and measurement role of neuroscience has a, has a role to play. But I think more deeply, and I think more directly related to uh, sort of the central levels of analysis claim is that I'd like to argue that uh, it turns out that there's still a role for irrelevant neuroscience to play in sort of the social activity and construction of behavior, even if strictly it's irrelevant. And I think the reason for this, my wife is smiling because she's been making this argument for three years and I've resisted it every step of the way. And I think the reason for this is because at heart, people are not strictly logical beings, that we engage in behaviors which are not entirely defined by rational statements about 
uh, what we know about uh, the information that might make that decision. So just for example, uh, you know, suppose your son is not doing well in school and he doesn't study well and you get him to exercise and uh, when he exercises he, he does better studying and gets better grades. Now I could do the analysis and tell you that, oh, because he exercises that improves frontal lobe function and that's why he's able to concentrate better. And from a strictly logical standpoint, there's no reason why you need that information, right? All you really need to know is that exercise leads to better grades. Like, why would you even want the neuroscience explanation? Yet, people are hungry for this stuff. You see it over and over and over again. For some reason, it keeps turning up in articles. There are uh, people who do leadership training exercises, all based around understanding what are the mechanisms of impulse control and behavior in the brain, and then, you know, teaching to the brain, right? So why is that? Why are people so hungry for these neuroscientific explanations? And so just in closing, I want to offer a couple insights into why this might be and why it might actually be rational to want to have this irrational, unnecessary information. So the first thing is, is that uh, while many in this room might deny that you have uh, an immaterial soul, nonetheless, many of you, perhaps all of you, are lurking Cartesian dualists. Right? You don't think that you have a belief that there's some separate mind stuff that interacts with your body. But nonetheless, you automatically uh, adopt that stance. In fact, you know, anytime you watch a movie in which uh, you know, two characters switch bodies and then go on and have mad high cap hijinks, right, basically you've accepted a premise which is dualism, that you can take a soul, a, a personality, and move it to a different body. And uh, studies by Paul Bloom and others have shown that kids adopt this dualist stance automatically as sort of a normal developmental stage. So one power of neuroscience actually is to let people overcome this innate uh, t tendency they have to separate out their uh, behavior, to think of it as a separate moral thing that exists apart from our biological reality. Additionally, neuroscience provides a nice causative mechanism. Right? So even if it's strictly irrelevant, it's still very useful to have uh, a narrative structure of neuroscience cause to behavioral effect to organize all the messy information you might be receiving. Right? So I could tell you, for example, your mother has frontal lobe damage, the frontal lobe is responsible for control and, and uh, restraint of automatic impulse activity in the rest of the brain, so therefore you can expect your mother to, ex to exhibit poor impulse control in the things she says and the choices of food she makes to eat and all the rest. That narrative, providing sort of a concrete neuroscience cause and effect, is something that's easier for folks to understand uh, and to, to take in as a narrative structure. And so finally, uh, what I'd like to close with is that uh, this ability for people to have a neuroscientific underpinning and understanding uh, might actually provide a little bit more of uh, an understanding of, of the state that other people find themselves in with regard to their behavior. And so by this I mean, just take, for example, the difference between how we view, uh, as a society, psychiatric problems and neurological problems. Neurological problems are ones which generally do not have any stigma attached, because, hey, how, that, how could that be your fault? That's a neurological problem. It's a disease which is the consequence of damage to your brain. Whereas a psychiatric illness, just simply by the status of it not having a physical manifestation that's easily seen or characterized, is accorded a very different kind of moral status. And the question is, is it the case that we might end up with uh, people who behave better to others, have a better, sort of more uh, uh, kind society in one in which neuroscience informs our understanding of these sorts of behaviors and their manifestation. So at least I don't think we should rule it out a priori. So thanks very much.